named for his family and Malcolm Wahlberg, his father's business partner, has benefited the city's residents through dozens of organizations. The foundations who assets, whose assets total nearly $100 million have given money to the National World War II Museum, the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Contemporary Art Center, Turo Infirmary, No AIDS Task Force, the Urban League of Greater New Orleans, Covenant House, Temple Sinai, and many others. Through the foundations, Mr. Goldring played a major part in developing two of the city's popular open spaces, Waldenburg Park along the Mississippi River, and after Hurricane Katrina, City Park's Great Lawn. Goldring also helped spur revitalization of the warehouse district block that is home to the National World War II Museum, the Contemporary Arts Center, and the Ogden Museum. He was also instrumental in building the Metairie campus of the Jewish Community Center and the Holocaust Memorial in New Orleans. Mr. Goldring's impact includes educational opportunities provided through scholarships to employees of his companies. Mr. Goldring recently received the 2011 Times Picayune Loving Cup awarded annually for civic service offered without expectation of public attention or material reward. Let's welcome Mr. Bill Goldring. So really quickly, because this resume discusses, this bio rather, discusses the philanthropic nature of your business, but there's a, another very significant business that uh, your family has been involved in for several generations. So could you tell us, tell us a little bit about that, that side of the business? Sure. Um, we're in the beverage alcohol business, and my uh, grandfather started the business in Pensacola, Florida in 1898. Uh, he came to the United States uh, at the age of 12 without parents and uh, somehow ended up settling in Pensacola. And when he was 29 years old, he uh, started a little mom and pop wholesale liquor company in Pensacola. So that's uh, kind of the, uh, the, the roots and the foundation of uh, where it all started, but it's uh, come a long way since then. Uh, how did that mom and pop company uh, grow to be uh, what it was when you guys finally uh, uh, sold the business? Well, um, the government put us out of business well before I sold the business. Uh, in 1919, uh, there was something called Prohibition. And uh, Prohibition was uh, an act of uh, government. Uh, it was the uh, 18th Amendment of the United States. Uh, and the only the only industry in the Constitution of the United States uh, is beverage alcohol, and it's the 18th and 21st Amendment. Uh, the 18th Amendment uh, put us out of business. The 21st Amendment put us back in business. So my father was 12 years old at the time, and uh, uh, the family moved to Chicago. Uh, uh, my father ended up at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, prohibition ended in uh, 1929, uh, and my father uh, went to law school, became a stockbroker, uh, made a lot of money. The Depression came, and the family lost everything with the Depression and moved back to Pensacola uh, in the late 20s, 10 years, I'm sorry, uh, in the late 30s. Uh, prohibition ended in the state of Florida after National Prohibition. So uh, my father opened up a small uh, wholesale company. Uh, he was bottling wine, uh, bottling uh, liquor over in Pensacola, uh, and had a bar room. Uh, married my mother in um, uh, 1939, that same year, and in 43 moved back to New Orleans, uh, which was the year I was born. So a, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. Um, I ended up uh, in school uh, across the city at Tulane, and when I graduated, uh, I went to work for uh, Seagram Distillers. Uh, they were the largest distiller in the United States, and my father had opened up a wholesale liquor company in '44 in New Orleans with Malcolm Woldenberg. And uh, uh, by the mid-60s, I graduated from Tulane, and I ended up uh, uh, 
going into the business at that time. And uh, then the business gradually expanded uh, after that. My father retired in the late 60s, uh, and at that time we were in the wholesale business uh, just in uh, uh, half of Louisiana uh, in the Panhandle in Florida. So that's where it started, and um, uh, you want me to take it from there? Well, at the time of the, when your father retired, what, what was the size of the business in comparison uh, to underneath your leadership where right. you, you grew it through? Well, when I, when I got into it, there were about 200 people in the business, uh, in, in, our, in our companies. And uh, uh, we uh, had a real nice wholesale company just operating uh, in part of Louisiana and part of Florida. Uh, I took the business from there uh, to 8,500 people, and we were the uh, second largest wholesaler in America operating in 25 states. That's pretty significant. Yeah. There are stories of folks who amass a tremendous amount of wealth. Um, and their wealth may be displayed through uh, things they own. Um, but a good portion of the wealth that your family has developed is d displayed through uh, philanthropy. I've always wondered, what do you think makes a difference between those who covet versus those who share, especially when you get to such a, you know, a high level of accumulation of wealth? Well, one, one thing about... Uh, having wealth that if if you can't enjoy uh, giving uh, more than you enjoy receiving uh, it, it's hard to have an understanding of that but uh, when my father died uh, I gave his entire estate uh, to our foundation and I kind of figured that I would never miss a meal uh, and I had uh, uh, three wonderful children and a wonderful wife, and uh, we just uh, uh, felt that, uh, that that giving was uh, a lot more important than, than receiving. So we had a great business. I knew that I could make uh, uh, more money in, in developing the business to greater heights. And one of the other main reasons uh, was I didn't want to give 55% of uh, <laughs> my father's estate to the government. Um, and I never have believed in the death tax. You know, we pay enough taxes when we're alive. But uh, anyway, we, we had uh, a number of different businesses. The, the wholesale liquor business was one. Uh, the uh, uh, wholesale beer business was another. Uh, a beat of beer, production of beer was another. And the Sazerac Company, uh, that uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, was another. And that's completely different than the wholesale businesses. The Sazerac Company uh, is probably uh, the oldest ongoing company in the state of Louisiana. It was founded in, in 1850, and um, uh, we uh, were a producer of, of beverage alcohol uh, operating in the city, and our, our main product was something called Taka Vodka at the time. And, and Taka is the largest selling beverage alcohol in the state of Louisiana. Uh, vodka started in the uh, mid to late 50s. And when, when vodka started to sell, uh, it was during something called the McCarthy hearings. And there was a United States Senator called Joe McCarthy. And he went around calling everyone a communist. Uh, because that attracted a lot of attention. And you see how politicians attract attention today. Uh, so uh, in calling everyone a communist, uh, there were all kinds of hearings. And one day it'd say, uh, there are four communists in Congress. And the next day, there were 24. And the next day, there were 64. And everybody in Hollywood was a communist. <laughs> so if you were drinking vodka, and vodka was a Russian product, Naturally, you must have been a communist. So there was a reason why vodka sold, uh, and there was also a reason why people didn't want to drink it when it first came out. 
Uh, vodka is something called neutral grain spirits. It, it, according to government definition, it's an unaged product, and it can't have any taste or any odor. So people were drinking nothing but, but bourbon and, and a little scotch whiskey at that time, uh, and, and vodka was kind of deemed uh, as a nothing type of a, a product. But the reason why vodka sold uh, was because it didn't have any taste, color, or odor, and, and people could drink it and mix it with tomato juice or orange juice or pineapple juice, and whatever you mixed it with, that's what it tasted like. So we came up with a saying for Taka Vodka, which you may have seen on any of the billboards. I don't know if any of you uh, read billboards, but uh, you know what the saying is? Makes it easy just to add people. Very good. We have used that saying since 1958 and, and stayed with it, and the brand uh, has grown every single year since we came out with it. And the way we got vodka into the market uh, was kind of interesting. If you bought a case of bourbon, um, you got three bottles of Taka vodka free. If you bought a, uh, a case of half pints of uh, scotch, you got six half pints of vodka free. So we kept giving it away and giving it away and giving it away. And finally, the, the retailers had it up to here, and they started pushing it a little bit, and people started tasting it and liking it and uh, it, it didn't leave a smell on your breath, uh, and it just became more popular and more popular, and we have continued to be the uh, the largest advertiser in the uh, uh, state of Louisiana, and Taka has become a national brand. So uh, that was where Sazerac got started, uh, but really we were just a bottler, and we really didn't produce uh, the product. We were buying it from another source out of Kansas, but bottling it under uh, our label. Uh, in 1990, uh, I bought a distillery in Kentucky, and uh, the distillery had been known for the uh, great quality of producing bourbon, uh, and bourbon was kind of going downhill for years and years. Today, uh, bourbon is a real cult product and we sell every drop of bourbon that we produce, uh, hmm. and uh, it's, it's very tough to, uh, you, you can't just go in the bourbon business, but I'll come back to that a little later. There are only 10 bourbon distill 10 distilleries in the United States today, uh, and we own five of them. Um, so, um, anybody drink bourbon? You ever hear of Buffalo Trace? Buffalo Trace uh, in our distillery is rated uh, the best distillery in the world today. And uh, the whiskey writers of the world uh, have given us this award six out of the last 10 years. And the award has never been given to an American distiller mm -hmm. other than uh, us. Uh, this year in uh, Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible, uh, he rates the top 100 whiskeys in the world, uh, and we had four out of the top six, and the number one, and the number two uh, brand. The Wall Street Journal, uh, four months ago, did a, uh article, two full pages, and we were the cover of one of the sections uh, on our distillery, and it talked about uh, different brands that we, we produce, and we produce maybe 40 different bourbons, um, as well as a, a number of Canadian whiskeys that are produced in, in Canada. Uh, there's one brand called uh, Pappy Van Winkle, and I don't know if you've heard of that, but it sells for as high as $700 a bottle, if you can find a bottle of it, but it's on allocation, and uh, uh, as soon as someone sees a bottle of it, they'll buy it, and uh, it's also 23 years old. So you, you can't, it's not like four o'clock vodka. You know, <laughs> four o'clock vodka, you make it at four and sell it at five. Uh, but, but good bourbon takes a long time to produce. Um, you'd like a little history about bourbon? or Please. Um, bourbon's an interesting product. It can only be produced in the United States. 
And uh, to produce bourbon, it's in new charred oak barrels. And the barrels uh, are one of the keys to producing great bourbon and how you pick the wood. And um, uh, most of our really good bourbon is in a French oak barrel. And when you age bourbon, after six years, you lose 23% of the bourbon to evaporation and it soaks in the wood. Uh, so the, the, the cost of producing bourbon is uh, great just to start off with. And um, uh, then you're, you're losing a, a, a fair amount of it. Uh, it. It's totally different if you are producing Scotch or Canadian whiskey because we ship our barrels to Scotland, to Ireland, and to Canada, and they use our barrels, uh, uh, and our barrels sell for a premium uh, because of the quality of these barrels. So they're, they're using uh, these great barrels that, that we have put Buffalo Trace in or Van Winkle. Um, anyway, that's basically uh, what, what bourbon is all about. Um, when you said your father retired, he left the company with about 200 employees. Right. And then you grew the company to 8,500 Correct. employees. Right. What, I mean, not to be, not to make this too much of a cliche, but I have to ask. Sure. What's the secret to success? The secret to success, well. Is there a secret uh, to success? First, you have to have a passion for, for whatever you do. Um, and... Um, uh, I've always said my secret was hiring people around me that are a lot smarter than I am and s surrounding yourself with great people uh, who know more than you and are not afraid to look you in the face and tell you you've made a mistake. And um, uh, the, the smartest guy I know in the whole world uh, is a fellow by the name of Paul Fine who uh, uh, has got a PhD from UNO. And uh, uh, he had a chance to go to Harvard, uh, and he elected to go to LSU. Uh, now this may not sound smart, but he couldn't have a car at Harvard, and he could have a car at LSU. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he went to LSU, came back here, and, uh, and got a PhD at, uh, at UNO. Uh, and when, it, when he... Uh, uh, got out of uh, school here, he went to work at Tulane, and he worked directly underneath the president of the university, and he basically ran the university and the endowment uh, and the foundation. And uh, uh, Paul and, and other people, I've got an organizational structure with four direct reports, but he's the number one. And uh, the first thing I told him when he went to work for me uh, is that if he thinks I'm wrong in anything that I do uh, to go F myself and uh, uh, he's always done that and and you, you've, you've got to have a relationship with people that that are not afraid of you and and help you make good decisions and in a lot of big companies you'll find uh, the boss always has three votes and everybody else has one vote. And the boss can overrule people. I've never, ever let uh, uh, that get in the way of me in having somebody tell me uh, when I'm wrong. Uh, I, I gave you a list of uh, uh, leadership qualities here that I don't know if you've had a chance to look at, but uh, about, no... Ten years ago, uh, my godson uh, was 21 years old, and um, I gave him this as a, a graduation present uh, with something else, uh, and and went over all these different qualities. This took me uh, about two days to write up. I kept thinking of more things to put down, uh, but it's a real sincere list of um, different qualities that I think. Uh, that will 
guarantee success uh, and make you a better person. Uh, but um, uh, it's not hard to have a good personality, uh, but you really have to follow a set of guidelines that, uh, uh, you know, you're a real genuine person. And it's the old story, you know, uh, remember the people, what is it when you go up the ladder because you'll see them when you come <laughs> down. And uh, I kind of think what uh, this list is uh, all about. Let's go through it really quickly. Sure. Treat all people alike, whether the person is superior or subordinate in life, i.e. the chairman of the board or the janitor. What does that mean? Well, when you're walking down the hall and you stop to talk to somebody, don't look over someone's shoulders. You know, I hate that with politicians that, uh, you know, you'll be talking to a politician and they'll be looking at the person over there <laughs> or over here. And, and you've got to genuinely look someone in the eye when you're talking to them and listen to them. Ability to get along with everyone, regardless of race or religion. Uh, you know, that, that speaks for itself. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, you can get along with 99% of all people uh, out there if you take the time to try to understand them and have empathy. Be caring and sensitive of other people's feelings. Uh, some people, uh, feelings you might not think are, are genuine, so to speak, but perception becomes reality. And if someone perceives something to be true, uh, then that's their belief. And you should have feeling and empathy toward what they do. Be a good listener and be immersed civically, politically, and charitably. Uh, just get involved. Get involved with, uh, uh, you know, charities and helping people, uh, having understanding of politics. Eighty percent of the people out there that vote don't know who they're voting for. You know, they're, they're voting for them uh, for one reason or another, but it probably has nothing to do with knowing what the person really stands for. And really, it's next to impossible to know who you're voting for. Uh, but, but if you delve into it a little bit and try to look at people's records, and uh, uh, you can make solid judgments or better judgments than just looking at a TV ad. You, you really can't believe 90% of what you see on TV. The, the one thing about uh, uh, the newspaper is that the newspaper will not, I don't care what the, the name is, if it's the Advocate, the Times, Picayune, or, or Gambit, newspapers won't take ads uh, that can't be verified. Television stations will let you say anything you want. Participate and encourage community activities. Uh, a little bit of uh, the, the previous one. Um, uh, there, there's so much out there in, in and being a community activist and, uh, you know, no, no matter what it is, uh, in, uh, in, in helping people and mentoring people. Uh, over the years, I've tried to uh, continually uh, mentor people and I'll uh, just spend lots of time with, uh, with young kids. Make people feel comfortable in your space or surroundings. Um, there are different ways to, uh, to, to make people comfortable, but uh, uh, I'm not sure if I could really explain that, but uh, I think most of you know how to make someone comfortable. It's easy to make someone uncomfortable, uh, but uh, to make someone uh, comfortable, uh, you look them in the eye, uh, you touch them, you put your arm around them. When others deserve praise, never hold back with compliments to make them feel good. That's really easy. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I could look at you and say, gosh, that's a good looking dress. It may be the ugliest <laughs> dress in the world. You know, all oh, those, those purple and yellow <laughs> shoes. My God, where'd you get those? But, 
but there, you know, there, there's a way to make people comfortable and just uh, telling them, you know, what a good haircut you have. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you know, uh, maybe that's not necessarily being totally genuine, but it sure is a lot worse to say, God, where'd you get that haircut? <laughs> so uh, that, that gives you a relationship with the other person, and it says, he's a nice guy. I'm going to combine eight and nine. Ability to be a good leader in, in setting examples for others, establish high degree of morality within business or family, and be kind to children and animals. Um, so which one of those? Any? Well, uh, why did you decide to throw animals in there? Um, I, I think being kind to, to children and animals, uh, I remember hearing something once on TV with uh, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. They were talking about uh, uh, being able to sing. And you don't have to be a good singer, but uh, anybody that, that likes music has got a soul. And, and anyone that uh, can be kind uh, to, to young kids uh, and, and animals uh, has a different soul that other people might not have. And it's just if you can touch animals, you can surely touch people. Provide for your family, set a good image, and have a healthy balance between work and family. Um, well, sometimes that's tough to do. Uh, you know, people get caught up in their work, uh, but you've got to provide that balance in between. And um, you know, when you have kids, you've got to give them attention, and um, uh, sometimes you have to work at it a little bit harder, uh, you know, whether it's uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, you sit down at the table uh, with your kids and make time for them uh, at the end of a day, uh, and if you can't do it at the end of every day, uh, you know, cut some slack and do it on the weekends. But. Uh, you've got to provide for the family, you got to take care of them, and uh, you got to um, make sure that relationship is there, and it's just not all about work. Power is something that comes with the territory and does not have to be shown as others recognize it, but never abuse it. That's an interesting one. Um, I have a close friend that I play tennis with. And half of his life is tennis. And that's all he talks about is, is how good his tennis game is. And uh, never stops talking about his tennis game. And he's really not that good of a tennis player. <laughs> and I, I, I tell him, I said, look, Cliff, I said, when, when your tennis game is, is as good as you think it is, you won't have to say anything because people will know it. <laughs> And, and it's the, the, the same thing, um, uh, you know, about uh, business. Let me, let me go back to this. Um, uh, you know, we should all live to be half as great as our reputation. And that, uh, uh, you know, people develop uh, a, a certain amount of uh, power. But, uh, you know, one of the great musicians in, in, in the United States today but, you know, he doesn't have to go talking about it. Uh, people just know how good he is. And uh, it's the little things that he does that he does not have to shove it down somebody's throat that I'm better than you. Look people in the face and not over their shoulder. I think you covered that one. I did cover that, and that was uh, something my mother told me uh, when I was very young. She said, um, give people a firm handshake Look them in the eye, uh, and uh, uh, two very important things that, that I got from my mother. I'm going to read these next four together. Two of them are adverse to one another, which is interesting. Okay. Never avoid confrontation. Stay cool at all times and never lose control. Be optimistic and be health conscious. All right. Uh, never avoid confrontation. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, some people will walk down the street and cross the street to avoid seeing someone that they don't want to talk to. 
uh, I would much prefer if I've got a problem with someone uh, not to let it linger uh, and either call them or meet with them uh, and get it out at the open and um, it, it just works out better. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know if I have another one in here about uh, procrastination, but uh, you know, you can't procrastinate. If you've got a problem with somebody, you've got to be up front with it, you've got to talk about it, and you could agree to disagree. Um, you've got to stay cool and never lose control, uh, other than with your children. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, actually, uh, I don't think I've ever lost control with my children. Um, but it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's staying in control of yourself and, and your emotions and, uh, and you know, you, you develop high blood pressure when you, uh, when you lose control. And um, um, Richard Nixon had a, uh, a saying when he left office, who was not one of my favorite people, but uh, uh, Nixon said that uh, uh, when, when someone hates you and you hate them back, uh, you will only destroy yourself. And that's what happens when you lose control. Uh, it's a great quote, and it's something to remember, and, and you can Google it, and, and that's not the exact words that were used, but uh, uh, I thought it was pretty important. Um, be optimistic. Uh, it's the old story about is a glass half full or half empty. Uh, uh, I've always said uh, you know, I've never had a bad day in my life, uh, and I really mean that. I mean, you know, the, the worst of days that somebody else may have. Uh, you know, if I get up and I'm breathing, uh, life is good, and uh, uh, people around you are good, and, uh, you know, it's just easier to be optimistic and to make a practice of uh, uh trying to do that. And when you see yourself uh, in a negative mode, uh, you got to think about where you are and who you are and how you can pull yourself out of that. Be health conscious. Uh, since I was 12 years old, uh, I have worked out every single day of my life unless I had pneumonia. And uh, some days, twice a day, uh, in the morning and, and in the evening uh, before dinner. And uh, if you can work out and keep your endorphins going, uh, everything around you looks better. Uh, and, and exercise is the single most important thing you can do. Uh, you know, some people have good genes and they live a long life, but if you live a long life and you're not healthy, uh, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable in this world high energy level that is constructive in everyday living and have a good self-image and good self-esteem? Um, well, that, that comes with number 16. Um, if you take care of your body, uh, you will have a high energy level. And um, um, there's something that I, that I have done to, to have that high energy level and it's called meditation and, and this is not a religious type of meditation uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, transcendental meditation or primordial meditation uh, but in the early 60s uh, the Beatles uh, went over to India and, and met with a Maharishi whatever his last name was in India and uh, meditation became something that was on the cover of Time magazine and Newsweek magazine. And uh, my mother was having migraine headaches. And someone said, you need to take her to a transcendental meditation studio and teach her how to meditate, and the headaches will go away. So I went with my wife, and we spent two days meditating and uh, her headaches went away. And uh, this was one of the more important things that I've done in my life. You should do it twice a day, but if you do it once a day or you even do it three, four days a week, 
uh, it'll help. And meditating is the equivalent of 20 minute meditation is the equivalent of eight hours of sleep. And you should Google transcendental meditation. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Deepak Chopra, anybody know who Deepak Chopra is? Uh, I've been out uh, uh, and, and spent a week at a time with him twice, uh, once in California and once he was in New Orleans. Uh, Deepak Chopra uh, has been on all the talk shows over the years. He was uh, the guru for Michael Jackson and uh, uh, a lot of actors, and uh, he's published 150 books. And um, his is Primordial Meditation, and, and he has met with the uh, uh, prime ministers and presidents of countries, uh, and meditation is something that's been an important part of my life. Trust people unless they prove differently. Um, I, I think that really says it all. Uh, I'm a very trustworthy person, uh, and you can usually spot the people you, you want to want to trust. And you know, sometimes you uh, you may have to uh, before you get into a deal with someone, uh, you may have to get a reference check with uh, to find out who they are and where they've been. Uh, I was going to get into a deal with someone once in real estate, and, and I asked an individual that was friendly with this person, I said, uh, tell me about this guy. I said, is he trustworthy? And they put a nickel and they threw it on the table. They said, you see that nickel? He said, he wants six cents out of that nickel. <laughs> and I said, I don't think I want to be in business with this guy. But, but uh, for the most part, uh, uh, I've always had a feel of, of who I could trust, uh, and I trust them implicitly. Be overly philanthropic. Um, what number are you on? Where are you? 20. 20, okay. This is an interesting uh, one because one could say if you're worth a billion dollars, you can be overly philanthropic. Mm -hmm. But if you're yeah. a college student at the University yeah. of New Orleans and you just fight to make ends meet, how can you be overly philanthropic? Well, it, it, it's, it's just not uh, philanthropic in terms of uh, giving money to charities. It's, it's uh, when uh, you go into a, a restaurant and, uh, you know, you order a cup of coffee uh, and you can give somebody a tip, uh, you know, I would tend to over tip. And if you're sitting at a table and taking up someone's space, uh, you know, for an hour and a half and you're playing on your computer and uh, the girl works on tips, uh, so you got a cup of coffee for uh, a dollar, uh, you know, do you give her a, a 20 cent tip? Uh, or if you're taking up our space for an hour uh, in 20 minutes, do you give her a dollar tip? And, and I, I think you got to figure out, you know, what, <laughs> what you need to do and what's the right thing uh, in, in dealing with people. So uh, uh, being overly philanthropic does just doesn't mean, uh, you know, giving away the kitchen sink uh, to your church necessarily, uh, but it is uh, going out of your way to see uh, who might need help and seeing if you can help people, uh, and, and not just in money, but uh, uh, physical attributes. Always finish what you start and never procrastinate. Whatever needs to be done tomorrow can be finished today. My favorite line. Um, you know, I, I see people put off and off and off of things that sooner or later you're going to have to do it. And if you're going to have to do it tomorrow, you might as well do it today. I re return every single phone call every day, and I answer my own phone. And, and when, uh, when people call, they said, oh, I didn't expect to get you. I said, you called my phone, didn't you? It's my phone. I said, who did you expect to get? <laughs> so um, uh, you're eventually going to have to do something. Go ahead and do it and get it over with. 
the, the, the last time I procrastinated it was a sophomore year when I was in college. Uh, and I didn't open a book for the first six weeks, and I had an exam. And, uh, you know, I realized I might as well have uh, been studying it all along, because sooner or later I was going to have to do it, but I was having way too much fun. Perseverance. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a saying, uh, I think it was Winston Churchill, and I can't remember the saying, but... Uh, 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 perseverance conquers everything and if you persevere and you stay with something uh, you will end up winning the game and uh, you know it's uh, uh, going to get an order if you're a salesman you know the, the first time the second time uh, you, you know you may not get the order the third and fourth time you may not get it, but if you if you stay with it, don't give up and just persevere in whatever you do. You know, if you, if you want to be a golfer or a tennis player, uh, you know, you just you, you just can't give up. One of the things that uh, uh, I started doing 15 years ago was Pilates, and it was one of the toughest things that I ever did. And Pilates is all about the core and exercise. And uh, I'd get up at uh, 6 o'clock and I'd, I'd go to the studio and, God, I, I, at 6.15 I was ready to throw in the towel. And it, it just didn't get easier the first year, it didn't get easier the third year. Finally, about the fifth year, I, I was starting to develop a, a little bit of a core. I got fat around the core, but I got a lot of core underneath there. So, um, just as I was getting better at what I was doing, I had four more exercises uh, that they made it a little tougher and a little, you know, it's like lifting weights. You know, you can lift 10 pounds, you can lift 100 pounds, you know, and, and you get up to 150 pounds, you can't go anymore, but you keep doing it, you can get to 160. So if you persevere in what you do, uh, you know, you, you will get there. Remember oh, by the way, uh, you know the story about Abraham Lincoln? about perseverance, one of the best stories of all time. Do uh, you know that he ran for office six or seven times and never won? Never won? He ran for president and won. Interesting story. Remember, only results count. I have a sign in all of my offices uh, uh, that when you walk out of the office, you see this big blue sign with yellow print, and it says, only results count. You know, bullshit doesn't count. And uh, people, uh, uh, you know, give all kinds of excuses, and they'll, you know, get up to here, but they won't cross the finish line. And you got to cross the finish line. And uh, you know what it takes to, to do that. And uh, you got to make things happen, not just get up to the finish line. Get as much education as possible, <clears throat> as intellectual horsepower puts you ahead of competition. That's why we're all here today. Uh, you know, it, uh, education is the single most important uh, tool. And, you know, we all think that we're really not learning a lot day to day, but it's like that rubber band that just stretches and stretches and it just pulls your mind apart. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I, I never thought I was really learning anything when I was in school. You know, I'd take a biology course and I'd be dissecting a frog and I'd say, my God, well, how is this ever going to help me sell a bottle of liquor? <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I had someone that used to work with in a biology lab in high school and he quotes me on that, because I said that when I was in the 10th grade. But everything about education moves you forward. And uh, when I was in the business school, I didn't know an asset from a liability. But, you know, you stay with it. And, and I've seen friends of mine uh, that I went to college with uh, that got down to the last three hours or six hours 
and they never graduated from college. And, uh, you know, they were capable of going on and going to graduate school, but just didn't take the time to do it. Education is important. The six C's, caring, compassion, composure, creativity, charisma, compromise. But interestingly enough, you pick another C, the big C, communicate. Make sure other, others understand you with regularity. So why communicate over all the other C's? Uh, sometimes people don't really hear what you say, and sometimes you have to repeat it uh, a half a dozen times. And I've always believed in writing it down uh, because people just don't hear you. There's a saying someone once had on a plaque on their desk, I know you think you understood what I said, but what I said was not really what I meant. <laughs> so um, when I don't think someone is really listening to me and understanding what I said, uh, I'll write it down and send it to them uh, in a memo uh, after the meeting's over. Uh, but uh, communication to make sure your mind is in tune uh, with the person you're talking to uh, is very, very important. Teamwork. It's not about you. It's about us. That will make us all successful. Um, when I was uh, in, in high school, uh, I played on a basketball team. And we were undefeated state champions in Louisiana. And, uh, you know, there were 10 people on the team. And I actually went to kindergarten with most of the people on that team. And as we uh, went through junior high school and high school and we all played together, uh, we had a team and you could tell what the other person was thinking. So when you're in a business atmosphere and you're dealing with a lot of people uh, and they're all on a team working for the same goal, uh, it's important. Individuals don't succeed. Teams <coughs> succeed. Uh, Pete Maravich, who many of you probably knew the name, uh, was one of the greatest basketball players of all time. I mean, there's no basketball player today that uh, is any better than what Pete Maravich was. Uh, he was the one that started everything where, where people are today from uh, dribbling between your legs, behind your back, uh, he was the greatest passer of, of all time. He averaged 43 points a game in college, and there was no three-point rule. So he might have averaged 60 points a game uh, today. He was not a team player. His father was the coach. And, um, uh, you know, he shot the ball whenever he touched it, but uh, he was not really part of a team. He played for uh, the New Orleans Jazz. Uh, ended up with the Boston Celtics, uh, but was never a winner. Teamwork is what it's all about. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why uh, I don't play golf. It's just not, it's not a team sport. Uh, Try to meditate at least once a day, get eight hours of sleep, and take excellent care of yourself as no one else will. I think I already covered that one. You did. Live life to the fullest like every day is your last. Take chances and walk outside the bo box because everyone else is inside the box. Oh, you got to let it all hang out. <laughs> you got to. He does that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you really, uh, you, you got to look at the world and you, and you got to do your own thing all the time. And you got to look at the people that are in the box too, but uh, you 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 got to live every day like there's no tomorrow, because life is not a dress rehearsal. Above all, have a sense of humor, make others laugh, and smile a lot. That's probably the best thing on here. I mean, you 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 when you smile, other people will smile back at you, and uh, there's nothing like seeing people smile. I went to uh, a play last night at the Sanger Theater, The Book of Mormons, and it was a comedy and it was a musical. And, and I turned around and I was looking at people. I love to watch people. 
and you could just see the people smile and the energy that's there when someone makes you laugh and it makes you feel comfortable. <coughs> and, and, and you can make people smile all the time, and there's a way to do it. Uh, you've just got to figure out how to do it. We uh, do a prose questionnaire where I ask you a question, <coughs> and you say the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. You ready to try it? What? You ready to try it? Sure. What is your favorite word? <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Uh, the N word. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Success. What turns you off? Negative people. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck. What sound or noise do you love? Tennis ball coming off the racket. What sound or noise do you hate? Chalk. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? None. What profession would you like not to do? I take that back. Okay. Uh, singing. You, you want to sing? No, I can't sing. But that's what you, you would like you to do. Should... <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you serious right now? The, 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 uh, when, when I was... Uh, just to digress, uh, <laughs> when, I, when I was in, uh, I don't know, junior high school or before that, um, I made my uh, mother buy me a musical instrument, and, and I got a clarinet because it kind of looked cool at the time, and, and, and uh, there's nothing I could do musical other than turn the radio on, that's it. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, athlete, athletics were my favorite thing in life always. And um, uh, I got a report card back uh, from the music teacher, and it said, uh, "No work, no practice, no work, no practice, no progress." F. That same quarter, I got a, a report card back from the gym teacher, in the groove, on the ball, all the time, A plus. How do we get to that? What, what was the question? What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? No. You said singing. Singing. So uh, I was just thinking of that musical instrument that uh, um, that I couldn't play. <laughs> All right. So I mean, you that's why that's why I appreciate someone like this gentleman over here. What profession would you like not to do? got an answer and I can't think of anything. <laughs> in, in particular, one over the other that um, uh, profession. You know, I, I always thought at, at one point that not knowing exactly what I wanted to do, that I might want to be an attorney, but that would be something I would not want to do. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I drink buffalo trays. <laughs> <laughs> True to form. <laughs> um, let's open up for some questions. A few questions for Bill Goring. Uh, what are some of the business, uh, the wholesale liquor businesses you have in uh, New Orleans area? Because there's this whole city wholesale liquor place I pass like every day. Yeah, they're a customer. Oh, okay. they, they, they were a customer. They were like a sub-jobber. Um, at, at, at one time, there were 15 wholesalers in the city of New Orleans. And when consolidation started, uh, it, it went down to two, and there usually two wholesalers in every market. So uh, my family was in the wholesale business from 1898 uh, till 2010. 
And I sold the wholesale business in 2010 because the Sazerac company uh, was in competition with uh, a lot of our suppliers. And we became larger than our suppliers. And we're the largest distiller, producer of beverage alcohol in the United States. We produce 250 brands. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I don't know. Did I answer the question? Yeah. Uh, he's so he produce his business produces the actual brands that the wholesalers buy. Oh, okay. And what he's trying to say gingerly is that he was on both sides of right. the business until t 2010, until one side outgrew the other, and his competition right. started to complain right. a lot. We right. we had we had we had a whole a, a liquor wholesaler. Is like a Coca-Cola wholesaler. Uh, the Coke wholesaler sells to restaurants and bars and grocery stores, but there's a company in Atlanta that makes the Coke. Mm -hmm. So we've got a company called Sazerac, which is in Kentucky, and we make the product and we sell it to the wholesalers. And I was a wholesaler besides being a producer, but I got out of the wholesale business. Where did the name Sazerac come from? Uh, the, the Sazerac cocktail um, <coughs> was the name of a company that, well, it, it, the Sazerac cocktail is something called an egg cup. And the French name for it was Coca Cure. And uh, that was the French name for the egg cup that they produced the first cocktail, and there was a um, French cognac uh, named Sazerac that was used in making the original Sazerac cocktail. So the two of them were put together uh, and called the Sazerac cocktail from the French cognac. Next question. So <clears throat> I came in late, and you all were reading off a piece of paper that I can only assume that they were lessons in life or rules to live by or something like that. And one of the ones you mentioned was get eight hours of sleep. So I know a little bit about you and a little bit about your business. So I'm wondering if that is actually a rule that you <laughs> espoused, considering that you I didn't say I did it. I just said it. All right. <laughs> uh, no, but, but you, you heard the bit about meditation. Meditation is the equivalent of eight hours of sleep. Uh, but, I, but I do try to do it. Uh, if I get to bed at uh, 11 o'clock at night, you know, I may get up at 7, but uh, I usually get up at 6.30. Uh, but, you know, it, it's usually always seven hours of sleep. Uh, but eight hours of sleep, I think, makes a difference. Do you go to bed? Uh, you probably know the answer to that question. <laughs> All right, last question. Um, so, other than just selling alcohol, do you consider yourself an enthusiast? Like, what? Is it, what do you consider consider yourself an enthusiast? Like, are you like? Do, do you enjoy the? Yeah. To like partake of the festivities, are are you only excited yeah. with the selling and purchasing? Is it just about the money, or are you also excited about the the bourbon that you're making? Well, I've got, a, I've got a great passion for everything that we produce. Uh, marketing and advertising uh, are two of the, the more exciting things that, uh, that I do in creating brands. Uh, it's, in, in today's world, uh, it's very tough just to uh, rest uh, at any point because new things come into the marketplace in, in every Field. And if you were just selling one or two brands, uh, you, you'd, you'd lose out because other people are coming into the market. So um, we have a brand called Fireball. Have you ever heard of Fireball? Fireball is the hottest brand. You like that, huh? <laughs> it, it is the hottest brand in the beverage alcohol industry of all time. And it's not a real old brand, but it's a cinnamon-flavored Canadian whiskey. And the brand has taken off from here all the way up to here. 
and uh, it is becoming the largest selling brand in the United States in three years. You know, it's got a few years to go before it'll be number one, but there's some markets where it is number one. And uh, it has to do with quality of the product, it has to do with the packaging, uh, has to do with social media, uh, and uh, uh, I'm kind of a techno freak uh, in terms of liking uh, gadgets and, and computers, and uh, I'm not up to here with computers, but you know I'm always learning new things, and social media uh, is something that. Uh, uh, I've taken an interest in, and I don't know enough enough about it that I should. But uh, I've learned a whole lot over a number of years in in how to reach people, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Well, I'm going to got one in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. You Good. Should. Okay. Um, I read online on Nola.com that you had uh, you had mentioned a letter that you had gotten when you were 21 years mm -hmm. old, and I was curious if those or what your parents had told you also are on here, like on these rules that you have. Uh, Not really. I mean, I may have picked one or two things on there. My, my father uh, wrote a letter to me when I was 21, uh, and it was a letter that, that I just adored when I read it, and read it a number of times, and then I put it away, and I would hope that it would stay with me for my entire life. And years later, I couldn't find the letter. And I went nuts, tearing the house apart, trying to find the letter, and I couldn't find it. It was one of the most important things in my life in terms of a guidepost of, uh, of living life to its fullest. And um, one day, my wife said, uh, uh, we're going to paint the bedroom, and you've got to take everything out of every drawer. And uh, <coughs> You know, I complained, I didn't want to do it. Finally, I did it, and in the back of one of the drawers was this letter. And then I made 200 copies of it, <laughs> I never lost it again, and I put it on a computer. But uh, there were so many things that uh, uh, my father uh, shared with me in that letter uh, that is the way I've tried to lead my life. And it was the only letter my father ever wrote on an old-fashioned typewriter. Uh, it was a great letter. Well, um, I would advise that you guys do as I'm going to do, which is get Bill Goring to sign these 30 statements of being successful here. So if you wouldn't mind, and let's thank our guest today, sure. Bill Goring. Thank you. I enjoyed it, Doctor. Thank you, Maestro. Thank you.